Well, that's the paradise on Earth, Brazil. But what's it like in reality? Every day, how do people live? How do they get around? And what about the elephant in the room that is the violence? Cars here routinely have very dark tinted windows, front and rear, and even sometimes tinted windscreens. People preferring to pay the fines rather than have a bandido spotting that they're on their own and therefore prone to being robbed. When cars pull up to a stoplight, drivers put up their windows to at least reduce the chances of having a gun held to their heads. Given that, what's it like to ride a motorbike where you're fully exposed 100% of the time? The first thing to say is that, as far as I've been able to tell, motorcycles are first and foremost a relatively cheap means of transport in Brazil. I've seen very few of what in Europe we would call big bikes. 99% are small capacity, mostly 150cc. But just take a look at the figures. Brazil is a huge country, roughly the size of Europe, with each of its 26 states being the size of a country. Consequently, sales figures are impressive, to say the least. I've taken France as an example to make the figures more relatable. But overall, there are as many motorbikes sold in Brazil as in the entire European Union plus the UK, despite Brazil's population being only a quarter of that in Europe. As you can see, the bikes that sell in Brazil are the cheap and cheerful ones, like the Yamaha Factor I'm riding today, that will get you to work and back and, crucially, not attract too much attention from the bandidos at traffic lights. So that's what Mrs. RM and I chose to ride here. Well, not so much chose as have kindly offered to us by Antonio, who was repairing our pool. It's a Yamaha Factor 150, the seventh bestseller in Brazil last year, with 37,000 units sold. That's five times more than France's number one Forza 125. Now, before you have a go at me in the comments, yes, I know I'm not wearing any protective gear apart from the helmet, no gloves, shorts and t-shirt, and Mrs. RM was similarly attired. But the intense heat and humidity means that Honestly, traditional riding gear as we understand it in Europe just isn't an option here. I did come across a group of riders out in the country who were suitably geared up, invented armoured suits, but generally speaking, it's, to, it's shorts and t-shirts all the way here. Plus, as you can see, we were just cruising around the back streets of Olinda and barely got above 30 kilometres an hour, 20 miles an hour. Anyway, what was Antonio's Yamaha Factor like to ride? Well, as you might expect, pretty much like a 125. It makes 12.5 horsepower, weighs 125 kilos, right way up forks, a single 245 millimeter disc on the front, a drum brake on the rear, gets ABS on the front, and that's about it, really. The dash is very easy to read, and you get essential information like fuel speed and gear indicator. The suspension is soft, very soft, and it needs to be to soak up the many, many potholes and speed bumps on just about every single road. I've seen potholes the size of bath mats and up to 25 centimeters, 10 inches deep on main roads where the speed limit is 90 kilometers an hour, 56 miles an hour. Hit them in a the car and you'll almost certainly destroy the tire, wheel, if not the entire front suspension. Hit one on a bike and you're in a hedge facing a long walk home, or worse. What I'm trying to say is that unless you know the road, motorbikes here are best seen as a means of transport if you don't fancy taking the bus, trains aren't really a thing in Brazil, or if, for whatever reason, you don't have access to a car. Because unlike many other things, food, housing, services, Cars and bikes here are very expensive. I have the luxury of being paid in and thinking in euros. And if you do the calculations dividing by about 5.5, the price of a car or a bike in Brazilian real works out about the same as in Europe. This Yamaha Factor 150, for example, costs 14,690 real, which at the current exchange rate is about 2,700 euros. And that's what I would expect to pay for a bike like this in Europe. The similarly spec Honda CB125F, for example, is about €3,000 in France. Yeah, problem is that the average wage in Brazil is only about €500 Euros a month, a fifth of what your average French person takes home. So a Brazilian like Antonio, who kindly lent us his precious bike for the purposes of this video, has to work six months to pay for a bike that your average French person can more or less afford with one month's wages. 
Fancy something slightly more upmarket? Well, the 2023 Honda CB500X in France is 7,300 euros. Here in Brazil, it's 42,000 real or 7,600 euros. So roughly the same price, except that your average Brazilian is going to have to work six times longer to pay for it. To them, the CB500X actually costs over 40,000 euros. Another reason you see very few big bikes on the roads here. So how about riding in traffic? Well, lane discipline isn't the best I've ever encountered, but drivers are generally courteous to pedestrians and bikes and are happy to slow down to let you pass. Road rage doesn't seem to be a thing here, reflecting, I suppose, the more laid back approach to life of the Brazilian people. I was back in the UK over Christmas, for example, driving a Skoda Octavia rental across from Manchester to Hull and then down to London and drivers seemed much more on edge and aggressive than they do here, or in Portugal for that matter. Not everyone here is a bandido, and touch wood, I personally have never witnessed any violence directly, but Mrs RM, who grew up in Brazil, has had a gun pointed at her head three times while at the wheel of her car, so you can't afford to let your guard down or use ostentatious vehicles. Now, I've mentioned the potholes and the speed bumps, but there are also the wires. What seems like thousands of kilometres of wires and cables of every conceivable thickness and function, and they are all suspended in seemingly haphazard manner, just above head height, everywhere you look. Now, I know what you're thinking, OK, not the prettiest of solutions, but hardly an issue for a motorcyclist, right? Well, that's what I thought until I started noticing these metal rods bolted onto handlebars. I thought they may be antennas that were somehow connected to onboard radios. Brazilians love music after all. But when I got the chance to examine one close up, it was clearly just some sort of sturdy extendable metal sticking up for apparently no reason from the bars. So I asked a motorcycling friend, yeah, it's to prevent decapitation by one of the overhead cables as you ride along. Well, I wasn't expecting that. Now, I don't know if he was having me on, maybe you have a better explanation, but he was adamant that that's what they're there for. The idea is that any low-hanging wire hits the antenna first and is hopefully deflected up and over the rider's head before it has a chance to slice their head off. Live and learn, eh? Could I live and drive and ride in Brazil permanently? Yeah, I think I could actually, maybe not yet, but a house on the beach when we're retired, well away from the hustle and bustle of the sprawling mega cities, is an option I'd be willing to consider. Housing is affordable, certainly more so than in Europe. The healthcare system is top notch, both in terms of technology and accessibility. And the people are so refreshingly positive, friendly and helpful that it's hard to discount completely. The negatives I refer to in this video are maybe different to what I'm used to in Europe, the UK or North America, but I could reel off a list of things I don't like about all the countries I've lived in. Motorcycling? Well, I can't really see my Garage Queen Speed Twin out here. It's just too flashy and in fact, Triumph Recife, a city with a population of four and a half million people, recently closed for good. But something like the Honda Transalp 750 that I have on order with its pothole resistant 21 inch front wheel could work. I hope you enjoyed this brief look into Brazil from a motorcyclist perspective. I'll be back in Portugal next weekend, by which time my Honda dealer will hopefully have got their new Hornet 750 demonstrator for me to test. So please think about subscribing if you'd like to know what I think of it and my Transalp when that arrives in April. And as always, thanks for watching.